Welcome to the Dellingpod with me, James Dellingpod. And I know I always say I'm excited about this week's special guest, but I really, really am extra excited, I have to say, about this week's special guest. But before I introduce him, a quick word from one of our sponsors. And I urge you all to join this excellent man in sponsoring the podcast um i i think you'll reach a you'll reach an audience of the right people so this this is from ian dickinson and ian has made this this uh, soundtrack uh, uh, what he calls satirical synth pop whether you're looking for satirical synth pop or sardonic tales of modern romance tinderella's songs have it all they will make you laugh, cry, and hit like and subscribe simultaneously. Visit tinderella.info to listen to the sound of tomorrow today. I hope you're going to do this. Please, please, please sign up to tinderella.info. Now, let me introduce my special guest, Alexander War. Alexander, unusually, we're doing this podcast together. Because, well, you don't like doing it from remotely, do you? Not awfully. And I think I, my concentration is a bit better if I'm actually in front of someone yeah. who can admonish me if I make a balls up yeah. than well, in front of a screen. You get the, you, you get the sort of the, the visual signals and you get the, yeah, the, oh, you could be more on it and more natural. Alexander, there are so many things I want to ask you. Uh, I mean, we've covered a, a lot of this territory before in conversations at your gaff in Somerset. And I mean, you're Evelyn Waugh's grandson. And Evelyn Waugh is one of my favourite writers. I think, I think he's probably the best novelist of the 20th he, century. He's an extraordinary genius. I, I'm also, I know we're not going to talk about this particularly today, but I'm also the general editor of 43 volume scholarly edition of his complete works for the Oxford University Press. So, I, I am on that subject. If you do have questions to ask, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, um, actually, no. There, there is a there is a, a question which is which is actually quite quite left field and quite down the rabbit hole. I want to ask you about that, but we're going to talk mainly today about. I mean, an interest you developed. When did you start getting interested in the concept of Shakespearean authorship? I think it really kicked off by reading standard biographies of Shakespeare because you read any single one of them and you realise there's something deeply wrong going on. And, of course, in the background, any semi-intelligent person is aware that there is a, a problem, that whether you agree with it or not, or whether you looked into it or not, people know that there is what's called the Shakespeare authorship problem. Was William Shakespeare of Stratford actually the author of these plays that are attributed to him? And so being aware that there's a problem, but not thinking I necessarily need to look it up or do much about it, and reading, for instance, Jonathan Bates' book, The Genius of Shakespeare, you just suddenly realise that it's not only rubbish, it's, it's, it's silly, it's deeply silly. Um, the absolutely uh, brilliant American writer uh, Mark Twain said of, the Shakes of Shakespeare, he, the biographical Shakespeare, that he is uh, nine bones and 600 barrels of plaster of Paris. So in other words, we know nothing about him and it's all just sort of stuck together feebly. Was he talking about dinosaurs, do you reckon? Do you think he was talking about the dinosaur conspiracy then? Uh, well, I wonder. Maybe, maybe he was onto that. Because that's yeah. what they are. They're, I mean, they are about nine bones and 15 oh, tons. Of nine bones, which are not allowed to see, by the way. They're, they're all locked up in um, different vaults. You're only allowed to see the Plaster of Paris versions of them. Hey, maybe we should not do Shakespeare. We'll, 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 do, the, we'll do dinosaurs James, instead. James, I'm, I'm happy to go where, <laughs> where, wherever you want. I mean, all, all I would say was that, I mean, the, the, the Shakespeare authorship issue, once I got stuck into it, yeah. Uh, opened for me uh, a lot of doors about rubbish that's going on in the world. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's, it's one of the earlier examples and it's, a, it's a particularly interesting one on that account. And I got, I mean, I suppose my mind was always doubtful of facts that were just plopped in front of me from a very early age. And I remember distinctly irritating my maths teacher at school by saying, why is it that a minus times a minus is a plus? Because it didn't seem to make any sense to me. I, I wanted some sort of practical example of that actually being the case. And what does it mean to minus a figure by another minus figure? And how on earth do you end up with a plus? It sounds like a sort of way of defrauding anybody of any amount of money if you just have a lot of debt and then multiply it and suddenly you've got a plus sum. <laughs> anyway, my maths teacher was 
extremely cross and and I remember equally annoying my uh, divinity master at school by saying what what does it mean to say lo he abhors not the virgin's womb and uh, it, it seemed why why would god abhor the virgin's womb anyway and i was I was really surprised because my questions were genuine. I wanted genuine answers, but how angry they made the school teachers concerned because clearly they hadn't really thought much of this through. Um, so my mind was always directed towards getting underneath the skin of so-called facts that are just plopped in our faces. And the Shakespeare, I'm not going to regret it because I absolutely don't. I've discovered so many fascinating new facts about it, but it has no. been all absorbing. You talk about rabbit holes. I tend to want to talk about the reverse that that a rabbit hole for me is where everyone is in the darkness that actually i'd like to think that i'm at least waist high out of the rabbit hole and i'm in the light now uh, because the light is where i think we all should be heading on so many subjects i think you are quite unusual in that i one of the one of the questions i'm forever asking is to the awake among us is it what is it that that first alerted you to to the fact that things are, are not as they are presented to us and normally it's 9-11 is the obvious one um some people come at kennedy moon landings whatever uh not many i think go through the shakespeare route but it, but it but it's all the same isn't it it's all about deception it's very curious that it is the same and 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 what i discovered is to some of those theories that i studied later that they use sometimes the same symbolism and quite often one's looking at uh what i would call in shakespeare's days sort of proto masonic symbols numbers and things like that um that implies to me that the same group throughout time has been playing us around a bit yeah yeah so it's it didn't start in the in the um 16th and 17th centuries it, it actually uh, well, no, uh, but what makes me extremely nervous, and I, I think you're not so nervous about this, is whether it goes back as far as the Bible and parts of the Bible um, that, that have been manipulated, and that uh, that would be a very, very serious uh, deception. Whoa. Well, what I like about the Bible and what I like particularly about Jesus' teachings is this endless, endless talk about deception. Don't you know, don't, how do you spot the enemy? Well, because they're deceiving you. That's, yeah. that, that's the thing. And I, and I think once you've discovered someone's deceiving you, you can write them off or realize that they're baddies. It's much, much, much harder to say, oh, that person's telling the truth, that one's person's telling the truth, than to say that person's deceived me. Um, well, that's... We've sort of fast forwarded to something that I wanted to ask you a, a, a bit later on about who are the goodies and the baddies and how can we tell? And it seems to me one of the great tells of the baddies is secrecy. I think secrecy de facto is a, a, a bad thing. 100%. And I, that's why I've always said I, I've done a lot of study of Freemasonry. And there's a lot out there to study and it's very fascinating. I've always said I'll never ever become a Freemason, even if I were suggested as it, because I can't stick secrets. And the truth can often sting, can often be painful. Uh, but once it's out, it's out. And, and the truth suppressed can pass down even unrealized, even if you don't know what the problem is, what the secret is, it can pass down generations and, and, and pr produce people who are in pain and they don't even know why. And it's both because some ridiculous secret that their grandparents or great grandparents kept from them that they didn't know. And it, 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 the, that feeling comes right down through the generations. We must get rid of it. Well, I, I, I think it has a, a corrupting effect, um, secrecy, but also, I think it's bad for the soul. I, I don't know whether I've, I've mentioned this to you. I've, I've, I think I've mentioned it on the occasional podcast. That from a very early age, I found it almost impossible to lie. Because uh, I thought, mm. I don't know where I conceived this notion, I thought that people could, other people could see in my, inside my head. They can. And they, they, they knew when I was lying. So they could see through my deception and I felt uncomfortable with this. I, felt, I generally found it much, much easier to tell the truth. And it seems to be, you get a better night's sleep. Lying is agony, agony. And I, and I, I can't sleep today over lies I told when I was eight, nine, 10, 12 years old. You know, it really, really pains me. And why did I say that? What was the point? Nine times out of 10, I said it out of pride because I just wanted to look good in someone else's eyes. So I just told a, a lie. Of course, we tell lies at school when there's a, you've done something bad and you're 
threatened with a punishment and you want to get out of the punishment. But I, I, I agree with you a million percent. Just keep, keep hammering away at the truth. Yeah. And one feels so much better for it all through the whole body and the system. It's so much, and also it's so much easier. It's much easier. Yes. I, the, 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 you know, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive, uh, which is about the only thing I, I know of um, Walter Scott. <laughs> is pretty much unread. I, I, I know the saying well. I didn't know it's Scott. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, you think it might have been Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah. It, sound, it sounds a bit like it, but it, but it, apparently it's from Marmion. All right, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's 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 do let's do Shakespeare. Um, you, you talk about the Shakespeare problem. I mean, I I spent three years uh, at, at Oxford. Well, I mean, I, there was a, a year when you studied Shakespeare. And you, I mean, I read all pretty much everything he wrote. I didn't preoccupy myself too much with who wrote these plays because I was analysing the the tropes and the and the, the plots and the characters and things like that. It, it didn't seem to me necessary to know who wrote Shakespeare. But now I've now I'm older and wiser. It seems to me that it does matter, not least because of the the Welt and Shower of Shakespeare, which is quite interesting. Um, I, 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 I did a sort of mini essay on this for my sub stack, uh, which started off as a, as, as a, a notion called all your, all your favorite um, uh, quotations are lies or something like, something like that. And I started looking at Shakespeare and it suddenly struck me, here's a man, allegedly a man, <laughs> writing in an era when it was against the law not to go to church so christianity was embedded in the entire culture and yet with shakespeare you've got a pretty godless anti-christian uh, world well well i i have to give you a very simple answer to that uh, there was a law passing you weren't allowed to uh, put religious matters in, into place oh okay so, so that that is precisely why you don't get it ah okay um, fair enough and, and so I think that's, that, that's exploded my my particular well well i pieces. think you cannot draw from that that whoever okay. wrote shakespeare was not a religious man okay fair enough i mean in those were days of course when there was a very tricky um uh, uh, anglican catholic divide and so there were those problems that were going on uh, whoever he was uh, but no it, he, he wouldn't be allowed to fill it he would have been arrested immediately okay but another thing we're, 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 i'm sure we can agree on I'm, I'm, I'm on slightly uh, steadier ground here um it is political propaganda. We were talking earlier about Richard II, who was probably a really nice man and a good king, but in in Shakespeare, he's Richard Crookback. Um, it, 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 well, I think if you're taking the history plays particularly, uh, they're unquestionably uh, religious propaganda, and a contemporary called Thomas Nash more or less spills that out in something he writes when he talks about the importance of plays. Uh, there was a time when people went to plays in the middle of the day uh, and basically got drunk and fell about all over the things with prostitutes and the plays were crap. And it was consciously decided uh, by the government, by the Privy Council, that they, what they wanted to do is in order to elevate the minds, not necessarily the common people. In fact, in Nash's, when Nash talks about this, he talks specifically about captains, uh, lawyers, uh, courtiers, and I think he would have also definitely added students at the universities um, to make sure that when they went to the plays, they were actually elevating their minds, that they were learning to speak courtly, as the phrase is put there. Uh, in other words, not just speak in any old slang, rubbishy way, concentrate on language and take pride in one's uh, forebears. Where they, once again, that's obviously a, a tilt at the courtiers because it's the, the lords who appear in those plays uh, whose descendants are still around. And, and so that was a very, very deliberate plot um, by the Privy Council uh, to ensure that plays were actually useful. And I think they got this from uh, Italy, who was also some of those states were running a similar policy. Right. So, so, so the, all the things we celebrate in Shakespeare, the, the richness of the language and how he coined all these new words and, and, and phrases, that was a literary project, but also a political, sort of a, a socially improving Hundred percent, hundred percent. And and by the way, those things you just mentioned. I mean, you said when you're at university, it didn't really occur to you much. But in retrospect, now you're concentrating. Yeah. Uh, you need you need <laughs> you need a tiny little bit of historical context to realise that the man who is claimed as the author of those things, yeah, uh, whose 
uh, mother and father couldn't even sign their own names, whose daughter, Judith, signs her name with this sort of pigtail mark, um, you couldn't possibly have written these plays. And it's absolutely nothing to do with class. And, of course, you get that thrown back at you. You say, oh, you're just a snob. Um, of course, he could have done it. Uh, I'm not denying that someone of William Shakespeare of Stratford's class could have written the Shakespeare's plays. What I'm saying is William Shakespeare of Stratford did not write them, full stop. That particular man did not write them. And we have the case of Marlowe, for instance. I mean, Marlowe's father was a, was a cobbler, and he wrote plays quite similar to Shakespeare's. In fact, in my view, in the evidence I've dug out, Marlowe was Shakespeare's servant, and he worked in the scriptorium uh, with Shakespeare. That's well, Shakespeare being a pseudonym, of course. Um, so it's not, it's not a class issue. But with Marlowe, for instance, you can see very clearly that he went to school in Canterbury. Uh, he was at Cambridge for eight years. We know who he met. We know how he became a scholar. And we can see a very obvious path. And by the way, people say, oh, the next thing they say, it was a very, very long time ago. We just don't have the records anymore. Well, we do. I mean, it was a very, very well-documented period, the Elizabethan age. And we have playwrights who you, as an English literature student many years ago will know the names, but I suspect there are many people listening to this who will never have heard of any of them. Um, people like Anthony Mundy, uh, Robert Green, Thomas Nash, who I just mentioned, Henry Chettle. Uh, people haven't even heard of those people. They weren't great, great playwrights, but they were playwrights at the time. And we've got documented evidence saying they're playwrights, saying they're poets, proving that they were writing at certain tables, selling their plays for some Absolutely nothing for William Shakespeare. Nothing. And any learned person at the time, any person who's good at classics, I think you're, you're pretty hot on the classics, aren't you? <laughs> no, not, well, not like you. Well, well, no, I mean, you, and enough to know yeah. uh, that at Ilium yeah. um, is where the uh, patron goddess, uh, Pallas Athena, uh, also known to the Romans as Minerva, by her will shook the spear in, in enabling Hector to slay um, uh, sorry, uh, Achilles to slay Hector. And that to the Romans, Minerva was the patron goddess of playwrights. In fact, they set up their institution of playwrights on the Aventine Hill at the Temple of Minerva. So you've got Ilium, Shakespeare, which is an absolute obvious allusion to the patron goddess of playwrights, uh, with this wonderful W at the front of it, which is a double V, which maybe we will or maybe we won't have time to discuss. But um... Right, yeah, so... so... <laughs> All the classically educated people of that time, the, the, the upper classes, basically, would have been in on the joke. It would have been so obvious. They'd have got, because they were very good at allusions and things 100%. like that, and puns. They, they, tell me about the, They would have definitely known that. Why were the Elizabethans so obsessed with puns, numerology, this kind of thing? Well, they, they didn't have all the distractions we've got. Um, and these things are quite fun. I mean, we nowadays play Scrabble. Um, they had great fun working out what the number of their name was and how that number related to God, for instance. And now that would seem rather abstruse to us now, but that, that was a game that uh, the sort of intellectual learned end of the of, of certainly all around the court and the scholars enjoyed playing. Um, yes, you're right. I was thinking, imagine, in fact, you don't need to imagine because there are, there are records of this, how much more you could achieve in an era without Twitter Without the without those little um, uh, little rushes you get every time you, you, you somebody does an angry tweet or, or an X as, as as they now are. I was looking for example. I, I, I've I've been reading this biography of George Herbert, and I was looking at the education that they received at, at Westminster, mm. and they were so thoroughly grounded in the in the classics. Absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Um, the, the 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 depth of knowledge makes us look pygmies. Uh, it makes us look total pygmies. And, but also the other thing not to forget is that in those days, if you were a courtier, and you're going to find out that I'm leaning extremely heavily towards the Shakespeare was a, a courtier, the man who used that pseudonym, that you didn't write poems and plays or think much about these things except in your idle hours, as they called it, in my idle hours. Your, your duty was to, was to commonwealth and to government. And although lots and lots of the clever courtiers were writing verses, sometimes in Latin, sometimes in English, they never stuck their names to them. And they did it in their idle hours. In fact, if you, if you 
pick up the earliest thing ever published by Shakespeare under the name Shakespeare. Uh, there's a little dedication to the Earl of Southampton in it. And he says that um, uh, when, when uh, I hope you will receive this lovely poem that I've written. And the next thing I'm going to be doing is a, is a graver poem, which I'm going to write in my idle hours. He, he uses that very expression that courtiers since Gottfried von Auer in the 13th century in Germany have all, all been using to say that we write this, we, we write our poetry in our idle hours. I, I love the idea that, that the, some of the greatest works of literature in history were kind of dashed off in their in their spare time but you know was, well of course but it ties into castiglioni and this whole idea of sprezzatura that the, the idea that you're not supposed to as, as a courtier you mustn't show that you've sweated over something right. it's got to come naturally it's, it's this sort of natural ability to write but of course they sweated it's the it's the swan calm on the surface and yes. paddling furiously underneath yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, shakespeare's all about that and if you read ben johnson's uh, tribute to shakespeare in what's known as the first folio that's the 1623 publication of 36 poems a massive book that came out a very important book without it we would have lost a lot of Shakespeare plays Ben Johnson uh, who's a poet of the time writes about Shakespeare and talks about him in exactly the the terms of someone who um, is following the the courtly model of Castiglione have we have we dealt thoroughly enough with it, it wasn't the man from Stratford. Because obviously I want to move on to who it is you think you wrote Shakespeare. Not to the satisfaction of your listeners, no doubt. No. But, but I mean, uh, I did mention, for instance, the fact that um, uh, Shakespeare, William Shakespeare, Stratford's mother and father, were illiterate. Uh, his children were illiterate. That doesn't tie in at all well, I'm afraid, with, um, uh, with The Tempest, in which Prospero is so proud of educating his daughter. Um, this, this William Shakespeare of Stratford didn't bother to educate his daughters at all. Uh, you don't have to come from a family like mine, which is a very literary family, to know you can't have a pedigree that goes illiterate, 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 greatest writer in the world, illiterate. It doesn't happen. No, uh, and it, it, nonsense, it goes against it. human nature as well. I mean, Apart from everything else, and I know this is the case with my children, I wanted to make sure that my children were educated to a level where I could converse with them and, and, yeah. and share the same references. You, you'd never want illiterate children if you were... No, but you wouldn't be able to flow in that way. You wouldn't have that massive vocabulary. You know, back to the very basic quick arguments about why Shakespeare of Stratford has to be entirely wrong. First of all, the, the, the plays are entirely populated with... Uh, very, very clever allusions to very learned books. Many of those books, at the time the, the English plays were written, were not even translated in, into English. So we're dealing with uh, uh, works in Italian that hadn't been... So whoever wrote Shakespeare must have been able to speak Italian. Uh, they were clearly very, very, very good at, um, uh, at Latin and Greek. If you remember in, in Henry V, there's a whole great scene written in French, laughing about how a courtier speaks, an English courtier speaks uh, uh, French in a French court, making even down to the little mistakes and the comedy of that is absolutely wonderful. Now, William Shakespeare of Stratford, uh, as far as we know, never went anywhere near France. He, he wouldn't have gotten, even if he'd gone to the grammar school, which there's no evidence he did, at least not for 150 years after his birth, and was trumped up by a man called Betterton. But William Shakespeare, he wouldn't have learned French even if he had gone to the grammar school. So there's all this problem. And then you've got to work out how he got all, read all these very, very learned books, which are alluded to within the plays. Then you've got to realize how, how did he get hold of those books? And of course, the what we call the Stratfordianists, the people cleave, cleaving to this silly, silly tale. They say, oh, well, maybe, maybe he just borrowed them from a bookshop. No, the bookshops library. weren't lending libraries. <laughs> well, exactly. They weren't lending libraries. Books were incredibly expensive yeah. in those days. And unless you're someone like Lord Burley, or you've got some serious patronage behind you, like John Dee did, uh, you're not going to assemble a very large library. You're not going to have any money to do it. Yeah. Um, so, so that's all sort of rubbish. Then we come to the problem of, of his signatures. Now, we're told that six signatures exist of William Shakespeare of Stratford, three of them upon the will, one of which is completely indecipherable because it's decayed, um, one on something called a Bellot Mountjoy testament, uh, and two on uh, two different documents spelt totally differently within two days relating to the leasing of some property in London. And each of those spellings is different. The one on the Bellot Mountjoy case is extremely troubling for a Stratfordianist because what it says is Willem Shack P. Now, in those days, if you're writing your signature on a legal document and you knew how to write your name, you had to write it in full. 
first. So, so that what that is is a, is a Clark's attestation of what sits right below it, which is a massive, great, big blob, almost the size of your nose, uh, which is a mark. So it, it implies that Shakespeare, William Shakespeare of Stratford was what we call a marksman. Uh, ditto on the Blackfriars, uh, this is the, the property in London, leases. The two leases are both spelt differently. And the name, which people try to claim is a signature, is written on the seal ribbon that connects the seal to the legal document. Now, that is 100% a sign that what it is, is it's the attestation of the clerk saying this, this is the, the, the seal that pertains to William Shakespeare of Stratford. So we can wipe out three of the signatures straight away, one in a very embarrassing way, and then you've got the three on the will. Now, the will is a joke. Now, you've probably heard of the will because of one thing or maybe two the things. Bed. Exactly. So he leaves, second best he leaves to his wife his second best bed. The other thing he does is he leaves to two actors, Hemmings and Condal, uh, some money to buy a memorial ring with. Now, both of those, in, the, the, by the way, those are the only two interesting things in the will. The will otherwise is dead, dead, dead as a doornail. And it comes out of a book about how to write a will. Would the greatest writer in the world need, need to know how to write a will or get his clerk to do that? So those two points, the second best bed and the money for Hemmings and Condal, um, are interlineations. Someone has written between the lines and added those little bits. And we don't, I've got a, I think I know who did it. It was someone called George Virtue in the, in the early 18th century. Uh, but, but I may be wrong, but I'm, I'm absolutely certain that the will was tampered with, in, with. And how I know that is because William Shakespeare of Stratford had some very close friends called Hamnet, not Hamlet, Hamnet, and Judith Sadler. And in fact, he, he had twins, Shakespeare of Stratford, and he named them Hamnet and Judith after his great friends. Now, Hamnet Sadler signs on that will to generally attest to it. And in the body of the will, it's, and he signs Hamnet. In the body of the will, it says, I leave, I can't remember what it is now, some little token, to Hamnet. And it's clearly Hamnet. And it has clearly been altered. Someone has put an L onto the end to make it Hamlet, to try to connect him with the famous right. writer. And that's before we go to the, the monument, the grave, etc., etc. But also... If you'd written Shakespeare's plays, you'd be worth a fortune, wouldn't you? I mean, the, I, I imagine that they got paid quite well for writing plays. No, they didn't. Oh, OK. Uh, they didn't, actually, funny enough. Um, I mean, if you look at uh, Thomas Decker, who was a playwright at the time, uh, Ben Johnson, Chettle, Nash, certainly, all of those people uh, were very destitute, some of them going oh, to pris prison for lack of money. Um, and they were paid, you know, a, a matter of pennies for the work. Um, That's so, sad. Well, it, it is sad. It's also very interesting because it doesn't tally with how William Shakespeare of Stratford, about whom we have, let's say, about 70 documents. None of them suggest that he was a writer. He, by the way, never said he was a writer. His family never said he was a writer of any sort. Um, but those 70 documents show his business dealings. So we know he was involved with business. And he's supposed to have bought the second biggest house in Stratford, known as New Place. Uh, but it is absolutely certain that he could not have bought that uh, from writing plays. Right. So it was known at the time that William Shakespeare of Stratford was not the author of these plays. But was he um, was he sort of paid money to pretend he was or would people get, you know, oh, you've done another funny. <laughs> was he was he a stand? You've written a, you've written a play. <laughs> I hear another one. Yeah, well, well, I mean, if, it if that had happened, it's so obvious to me because he did have connections with theatre yeah. uh, that we that, that we know. Uh, whether he was an actor of much sort, we don't really know at the time. There's a, there's a little hint that he was just after he died that he was an actor. We don't know any parts he acted. We know lots of parts other actors acted. Um, so my view is that it's there's so much evidence that he didn't write this stuff anyway. Yeah. That, that had he had he pretended to write it, yeah. it would only have taken one man in the theatre, one of the actors with whom he presumably came across, to say, uh, oh, uh, Will, can you just explain what this line means? He wouldn't have the faintest notion because he, he wasn't educated to the, to the level of learning. I mean, look, you've been to Oxford University and very well educated in English literature. I'm sure there are lots and lots of lines that befuddle you from Shakespeare. It's difficult. It's yeah, very, very yeah. difficult. And, 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 you know, 
there's no question that there's what's amazing about Shakespeare is he can give huge pleasure to young children who don't have great education on one level, but huge huge pleasure to people who sit down and study it and work out all the illusions. Yeah, and the ones who the ones who laugh ostentatiously at, at the Elizabethan jokes when you go to see, or you, back in the day when I used to go to the RSC before yes. it became so horribly woke and oh. uh, also badly acted. Really bad. Act, actors have completely forgotten how the pentameter line works and how the rhythm of the thing should speak. They also shout the whole time. Um, I saw a production not very long ago of uh, Richard II, of, you know, people turning their back to the king and yelling and shouting at him. I mean, no, I'm sorry. And if you're, if you're angry, it's all carried in the lines. The lines are so beautiful. You can, you can whisper the most furious lines of Shakespeare and that fury comes straight out. You do not need to shout it. Who was the, um, the, the voice coach, Cicely, somebody, uh, who was for years at, at the RSC? And she, taught, she taught them how to speak the verse. And, uh, and it really helps. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's gone now. Now, what I was really uh, just asking you in a, in, a, in a slightly incompetent way was at the time, um, was was there this association with this man from Stratford, or or did that come later? Um, among the now, I, I have just completed a three volume book which looks into every single contemporary reference to Shakespeare, and I can tell you that every single one of them seemed to know uh, who Shakespeare was, right. and that he wasn't William of Stratford. And you may say, "Oh, come on, you're just being daft." If you go to the top. Stratfordian professor, Sir Stanley Wells, uh, Professor Sir Stanley Wells, and you say, tell me about this allusion to Shakespeare. Someone's writing about Shakespeare. Oh, he says it's a bit cryptic. Oh, well, what about this? And what about the grave in Stratford? I'm naming. Well, I can't really understand it. It's a bit cryptic. And what about this thing from, uh, from Weaver? Oh, cryptic. I found 10 examples of him talking about contemporary references to Shakespeare as cryptic. So you say to him, well, well cryptic, as we all know, means veiled or secretive. What was it about William Shakespeare of Stratford, this great playwright, uh, that was prohibited from overt expression by his contemporaries? What's the problem? Why do we need to be cryptic? If we look at the other poets at the time, Ben Jonson, D D D Michael Drayton, whoever you want to choose, people aren't writing cryptically about him. They're saying, here's a very brilliant poet. Yeah. And the, 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 but they're all writing cryptically. And these Stratfordians won't look. And now, now Stanley Wells, most of them are English literature critics. What's their job? What's an English literature critic do? He looks at difficult recondite lines and tries yeah. to work out why they're cryptic. But they won't. They won't go there. So they just run away from them. So I've written this with a fellow Oxfordian professor in America. I've written three volumes of about a thousand pages for, per volume, going through every single one of these. And we can show that 90% of them are telling us at the time, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. So it was obviously slightly prohibited from saying it overtly. We know that William Shakespeare is dot, dot, dot. OK, so let's let's cut to the chase now. Um, I have encountered people they all seem to congregate on my telegram channel for some some reason who are convinced that francis bacon wrote shakespeare and he and he was he was a contender for a long time wasn't he there was a, there was, it was a sort of battle between the oxfordians which we're going to come to in a minute and the baconians were, were, were there any other other sort of uh, yes christopher marlowe is sometimes brought up as as, as a possible one and um, then we get into slightly more silly territory um a man called neville who's ambassador in paris uh there's some really batty theory that he was an italian called john florio um no no black females uh the, the female who's mainly brought up is uh, lady sydney the, the mother of the the herbert brothers to whom the first folio was um dedicated whereas in fact i'm saying it, it was the uh the father-in-law of one of those dedicates. Now, the point about Bacon, Bacon is an interesting one. So to understand it, it's very, very interesting that, that the whole situation about how the problem started ar arising and when it arose. Now, as I've just said to you, I've looked at all the contemporary things, which takes one up to about 1642 or the late 17th century, and everybody seemed to know uh, that it was a pseudonym. I think that got slightly lost um, in that in interregnum when all the theatres were closed down between 1642 and 1660. Plays weren't allowed. And I think the last thing you did during that interregnum was to go up to Oliver Cromwell and say, oh, please, can we have our plays back? Look, we've got this wonderful book of these wonderful things that were written by this aristocrat nobleman who was greatly loved by Queen Elizabeth. Uh, that wouldn't do. So there was 18 years of just not putting any plays on and not perhaps thinking very much about who Shakespeare was. The age of biography 
book-length biography. Well, that didn't happen until the 19th century. So in the 18th century, what you got was editions of Shakespeare. You know, there's the Pope edition, the Theobald, and there was a multi-volume, and they quite often had uh, something in the front. But it wasn't biography. So if you take the first one, which was 1709, uh, it's got about 5,000 words, absolutely practically nothing on the life at all. And what, what is there is uncorroborated, or now we totally know it to be wrong. Um, so it's not really until you get into the 19th century where people start saying, we want, we must have a book length biography. Now, I'm sure you know all about, um, Samuel Johnson. Samuel Johnson wrote the lives of the poets and he loved Shakespeare. He wrote the dictionary in which he took, he cited Shakespeare 1300 times in his dictionary, yeah. but he couldn't come to write anything about Shakespeare. I, I imagine he realized it was bogus or it didn't work. There wasn't enough material. So you couldn't, you simply couldn't do it. Now, this is an interesting thing. The first book-length biography of Shakespeare was published, when would you guess? Um, early 19th century? Well, yeah, it, it's, it's, not, it's 1847, and by a man called Charles Knight. And it's all fantasy and Victorian rubbish. So Walter Scott. Uh, no footnotes. It's completely unscholarly. And, it, and, yeah. and a lot of sort of silly little stories come bumbling out of that, which is a waste of time playing through to realize how untrue they are. The first book length, uh, a book to say, hang on, this is all wrong. It's wrong. Shakespeare must be a pseudonym. Uh, well, guess when that was written? Or what? Yeah, when it was yeah, written. I think uh, it was published. It, 1880. 1851. So it's, it's literally within five years of the first book length saying Shakespeare Stratford did it came the book saying this is wrong. And this battle has gone on ever since. And it's become sadly more entrenched since English literature departments started up in universities. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but you, it wasn't considered possible to to study English literature at the university until about, I think, the 1890s. It wasn't considered a serious academic subject. And once the English literature lot got onto it, the pride, the glory, the esteem yeah. of being a great Shakespeare scholar uh, trumped almost anything else. And these people were not going to be gainsaid about who Shakespeare was because it made them look stupid. In the 19th century, I should also mention a man called John Payne Collier, who who was the, supposedly the one of the greatest Shakespeare scholars alive. Uh, but he got so frustrated about the lack of information to be found about Shakespeare when you can find it about everybody else that he started forging it. And all, you know, so many of the great like libraries. dinosaurs. Dulwich. Yeah, it was just forged. It was just simply forged. Yeah. And uh, there's been a lot of work to uncover. He was actually exposed in his own lifetime as a major forger. Uh, but he was he was forging annotations into first folios, and he had access to every single library. Uh, he was putting whole sentences. He was taking you know whole bits of old parchment and writing stuff, and and it's created a no end of muddle um, and problem. But that's the desperation which to to this day people seem to still be going uh, to avoid the bitter truth for them and the good clean truth for me because all truth sets you free that uh shakespeare was a pseudonym and it's as simple as that and it's been right in front of our faces all this time and so i've seen some of your your videos on your youtube channel and you you gave me a a, a, a a private um tour through the the geometry on on what was it the uh, the Shakespeare, well, there's the Shakespeare Monument. Uh, there are two monuments of e extreme interest. Uh, one of them is in Westminster Abbey, which was placed there in 1740. And the other one, of course, is in, um, in, in, in the Holy Trinity Church in Stratford upon Avon. And that's a great mystery. Anyone who's visited Stratford upon Avon will know this. You have a, a pathetic little cheap stone about three foot by three foot, which doesn't give the name Shakespeare on it. It just says, uh, don't you dare to, to lift up this stone. You'll be cursed if you try. Well, we all know why, because there's nothing underneath it. And then on the side wall by it is, is a more impressive monument, quite hideous now through over-decoration, uh, to William Shakespeare. And I made, well, I, I will always say it's the, hugely most significant discovery of my lifetime, uh, taking the view that nobody would lie in a church. 
uh, having done so much research that I knew perfectly well that William Shakespeare of Stratford didn't write this. So it meant looking at these monuments and working out what they were really telling us as what they as opposed to what they appeared to be telling us. Right. Now, the one in Stratford-upon-Avon is completely fascinating. I mean, uh, people might have a picture of it in their mind's eye. It shows what one man in the early 19th century described as a complacent pork butcher. Uh, it's got a bust of an idiot uh, sitting there uh, with a scroll with nothing written on it at all and a feather, a real feather, that hasn't been carved in his hand. The problem with that little part of the monument is if you look at the earliest depictions of it, and we have one as early as 1634, one 1656, he's not holding a piece of paper at all. He's not holding a pen. He is holding a wool pack. Now, we have evidence that he owned wool and his father was a wool dealer and he's in the wool business. So what happened? At what point did someone put a little pen in and change it enough to get a blank piece of paper? And why was that piece of paper blank? If he's the greatest writer in the world, couldn't they have just written something, a little quotation from Shakespeare. No, it's blank. And then you get underneath it the most extraordinary epitaph. And this is the epitaph which Stanley Wells says, it's a bit cryptic. <laughs> it's a little pathetic. And they love each other, I can tell. Right. It's got two lines in Latin. And then it's got uh, 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 six lines in English. And the lines in English start, uh, Stay, passenger. Why goest thou by so fast? Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed. No, sorry. Read, yeah, read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed in this monument, Shakespeare. Now, first of all, that's not English. Sad, sad, sad to have such a bad sentence on 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 the tomb or on the monument to the greatest writer ever. So I got it into my head that this was telling us something. It had to be telling us something because we know that Shakespeare of Stratford didn't write it. And I, stared, I had it by my bed, and I just stared at it five minutes every night, and I was still not getting it, still not getting it. And the key that unlocked it for me was the word within, because it wasn't a word, it was two words. Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed, with space in this monument, Shakespeare. Now, within is one word. So you ask the Stratfordians, oh, 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 it's just a mistake. They just did it a mistake. No, I'm sorry. It's an expensive thing. They did not make a mistake. The, the ruddy lowly who, who carved it would have been sent straight back to do it again if it was a yeah. mistake. And, and I read music at university, and I had this mad professor who used to say, don't listen to the notes, just listen to the, listen to the silences. So I stared at this silence for a bit, and I suddenly got it. In this monument is where it's asking you to figure out whom envious death hath have placed with Shakespeare. So take in this monument out, because that's where you're meant to read it. Read if thou canst, whom envious death have placed with Shakespeare. In other words, work it out. Read if you canst. Figure it out. Who is Shakespeare buried with? That's what it's asking you. That's the riddle. Where, where, where do I figure it out? In this monument. So we read the monument and try and work out who he's buried with. Now, above, you have two lines of Latin. And it says, uh, I, won't, I won't bother you with the Latin. I'll, I'll give you straight into the translation. It says, earth covers, mm -hmm, so we know straight away we're going to get the answer to the, to the riddle here. Earth covers uh, Pileus, which is the Greek king Nestor, with his judgment, Socrates with his genius, and Virgil with his art. Now the Stratford says, oh, yeah, yeah, Virgil. Okay, that's great. So it says Virgil, and he's obviously writing about a poet down here. But it's not, we're not, that's not what it was being asked. We asked, who's he buried with? Now, we don't know when Nestor was buried, Pileus. We have no idea. There's a huge squabble about where Virgil was buried, and we don't know where Socrates was buried. So what are these, what are these people doing here? Socrates has nothing whatsoever to do with Shakespeare. He didn't even write anything. He wasn't a writer. Nestor, or the judicious Nestor, it says, Shakespeare mocked him in, in one of his plays, I think Troilus and Cresta. Why, why is he on there? And Virgil, oh, we understand Virgil. Oh, yeah, of course, they're both poets. But no, there's a big problem here. If you went back in the times of Shakespeare and said, who's, the, who's our Virgil? Who's our English Virgil? Every single one of them to a man would have said, it's Spencer. Edmund Spencer was known as our English Virgil. And you, I can find you 15, 16 references to him as our English Virgil. So, so now that's getting interesting because Spencer is buried in Westminster Abbey. Yeah. So who's the next door one? It says uh, the, 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 sorry, so we had the, the genius of Socrates. Well, you wouldn't necessarily guess this, but 
Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer, who's buried next to Spencer in what we now call Poet's Corner, was said to have the genius of Socrates by numerous people. There was a man called Deschon in the 13th century who said, you have the genius of Socrates. This tomb is saying he has the genius of Socrates. Now, who's next to, who's next to Chaucer is the poet uh, playwright Francis Beaumont, who was known as Judicious Beaumont. So what we've got in Latin is references to Judicious uh, Nesta, i.e. Judicious Beaumont. Uh, the genius of Socrates is what contemporaries said that Chaucer had, and uh, the uh, sorry, the genius of, uh, um, of Virgil, which is what Shakespeare had. Those three are buried in exactly that row in, Pen in Poet's Corner. Now, very quickly, and we'll move on, just go back to the riddle. Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed within this monument, Shakespeare. Got it? Yeah. It's a riddle. Work, work out, if you can, who he's buried with. It's those three. So he's in Westminster Abbey. Now, let, 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 let's just come back to the point about who wrote these plays, because that of itself doesn't tell you that he's not William Shakespeare of Stratford. Mm. But it does beg the question. Why on earth wouldn't you put a monument up in Stratford upon Avon saying this is a cenotaph to our great, great uh, native poet and playwright William Shakespeare, who lived down the road at Henley Street and then now lies buried in Westminster Abbey? What is the point of making that a secret that only the clever and the learned can work out? Yeah, so that's the beginning of a major problem. And then, and I, I won't even go through the evidence with you because it'll take too long, but I'll just say what I found, which made me almost burst with excitement is i worked out exactly where in um in westminster abbey and now i'm going to give away the name my preferred candidate edward de vere who's the earl of oxford i've discovered exactly where he's buried and he guess where he's buried well you know because i've given yeah, it away yeah. i've given it away he's buried the poet's corner in poet's corner but more than that he's buried i found the exact spot where he's buried and he's buried directly beneath where they placed the monument to William Shakespeare in 1740. Now, if that doesn't already start putting proto-Masonic uh, uh, alarms off in your, in your mind, what does? Because it means that someone, so Edward de Vere died in 1604, William of Stratford died in um, 1616. Now, someone waited all the way till 1740, uh, well, so, sorry, first of all, Edward de Vere was reinterred, I think, in 1619 into Westminster Abbey. We've got yeah. contemporary evidence of that. And finally, uh, someone waited all the way till 1740, a little group of knowledgeable people, to place the Shakespeare monument directly upon his grave. I, there are going to be some people who are going to be watching this and who are going to be finding this so abstruse huh. because, because they have the minds of... 21st century people who haven't had all this this time to spend because they haven't been distracted by uh, the, it, it it seems almost impossible doesn't it that people could 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 think so abstrusely but but they did back then yes can can i just recommend to your to your listeners or viewers um that lots of the stuff i'm talking about i'm now putting extra pressure on them because I'm asking them to visualize some of the things I'm talking about. So I do run this uh, uh, YouTube channel, as you've mentioned, which I'm very proud to say has now gone over a million views and it's proving very, very popular. But in those videos, um, I, I make it a bit slower and it's all visual and it's all shown. And if I believe, I suspect that every single person listening to this now believes that they themselves have an open mind and are intelligent. Yeah. If they do that, go to that channel and you'll see my very calm and clear explanations of exactly how this works and they will come to the conclusion inevitably that it's irrefutable yes i i totally agree with you i am i am 110 percent convinced that edward de vere and his scriptorium wrote the works of shakespeare because you demonstrate what's the one way you show the the way that the, the lines draw together on the dots and um, so I've done that, quite a lot of that is to do with the um, with where he's buried. Um, if you're interested in that particular subject and encryption, which I know some people have a horror of it, yeah. but I think it, it's so exciting and correct that it's really worth watching. I can recommend a video I put online called The Incalculable Genius of John Dee. Now, John Dee was, to those who don't know, he was the Queen's conjurer. He was an extremely clever mathematician. He was a slightly dodgy person in many ways. He did seances and spoke to 
angels and demons. Uh, what was absolutely one of the most extraordinary things about him is he actually took down the conversations with angels and demons and hid them. And they were discovered about 70, 80 years after his death, hidden in a secret compartment of a, of a piece of furniture. And they're now all published and there to look at. And you find lots of people might claim to talk to angels and things, but actually to have the, the dialogues um, is, is absolutely incredible. So John Dee, and I present a lot of evidence for this, was the one who made these incredible encryptions that I'm talking about now. Oh, it was him who did that. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's why. So, so it's called the, the incalculable genius of John Dee. And that gives you an introduction into that encrypted part of it about where Edward de Vere's buried and how you can be uh, very certain of that point. But I've also put lots and lots of supporting evidence outside of those encryptions to show that people knew exactly that that was the case. Yes, we're not going to do that that here no. because it requires visuals mm -hmm. and it requires a lot more time than we've got. So let's let's go to the other evidence. I mean, OK, we talk about Edward de Vere and his scriptorium. I mean, I mean Edward de Vere was known as one of the preeminent poets of his day, wasn't he? Uh, well, and I, we've got three sources saying he was the finest and that he was also a, a leader among poets. Uh, one way, if you want to uh, annoy a Stratfordianist, you say, I've got one very small problem with your theory that William of Stratford wrote it. And they say, what's that, what's that? You say, well, he didn't know Edward de Vere. And they say, well, why should he? Because I'd say every single other playwright knew him. They, he had, they, they were all around his table. Uh, you know, why didn't he know William of Stratford? Um, so yes, Ed, Edward de Vere uh, is is named as as the uh, top of a list of uh, playwrights by someone called Francis Mears in 1589. A very very influence, influential book called The Art of English Poesy. It says that he stands absolutely uh, above uh, all the others in 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 among the writers of court and amongst the. It explains him as the leader of of a group of makers who are both Her Majesty's servants and members of the court. So I think we can't discount people like um, uh, Walter Raleigh, who was definitely a poet as well, from occasionally chipping in here and there. And now back to your point about Francis Bacon. Uh, Francis Bacon was effectively Edward de Vere's first cousin. In fact, he was Edward de Vere's wife's first cousin, but they talked to each other. He, Vere called him my cousin Bacon. Uh, so they came out of the same circles. They, they talked the same sort of language. Uh, Bacon was an incredible scholar. I have no doubt, well, I shouldn't say no doubt, but there's some quite interesting evidence that Bacon might have been involved with Johnson in the construction of this first folio book, which I was talking about in 1623. So Bacon's sort of hovering around there, but there is simply not enough good evidence to say that he was Shakespeare. In fact, he himself said, I am no poet. Uh, we don't have particular examples of his poetry. We don't have the endless nudge, nudge, wink, wink um, as that we have with Edward de Vere saying he's Shakespeare. Um, uh, you have to look extremely hard to find anything even remotely resembling that quality of evidence. Okay. So if, he's, if Edward de Vere was so good and, and suppose that he, well, let's accept that he wrote Shakespeare's plays, why didn't he just do it on his own? Why did he need a scriptorium? I think that he did end up more or less doing it on his own. What what happened in 1591 was he, he went bankrupt, finally. I mean, he spent so much money on theatrical performances at court and all these sorts of things uh, that he completely ran out of money. And it was considered a, 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 a huge loss of face for someone of his uh, position in life. The Queen, one of the most parsimonious people known to man, uh, suddenly decided to give him a thousand pounds a year, which is an enormous amount of money in that time. That's, this was in 1586, exactly the same year that the exchequer withdrew a thousand pounds a year from the revels office, which before that was producing the plays at court. So it looks very, very much that Edward de Vere and his scriptorium, and of course he was patron of lots of theatrical companies, including his own ones and boys' companies, all this sort of stuff, uh, that he basically took on to some extent, the the role of the revels. So he was putting on the place and getting going for the court for a thousand pounds a year, and to get this thousand pounds a year, he signed a document with with the, with the queen, which was a very secretive document, which we have, which exists, oh, yeah. uh, which says you're not under any circumstances to present um, chits and and uh, explain what you're spending it on, and that's exactly the same wording that is in in a document by Francis Walsingham, the great spy master, and his relationship with the with the money coming from the exchequer. He wasn't allowed to give chits; it's sec it's secret money. 
So as I, as I think I explained to you that, 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 that he was running this propaganda department. The black budget. Right. So there's, so there are a number of reasons that he doesn't come first and foremost as the playwright and why he needs, he, he needs a, a pseudonym. Uh, one is because he's operating as a, as a propaganda unit for the government. Uh, two, because he's a nobleman and noblemen in those days did not, uh, sink themselves so low as to put out little play courses and say, by Edward de Vere, Earl of Oxford, can I please have 15 bob for it? And three, because the Shakespeare plays are hugely autobiographical. And Edward de Vere led what some people might call a rather squalid life. I mean, I've touched upon his bankruptcy. Uh, there were sex scandals. There were fighting scandals in the streets. And he was a wild guy. If you think Byron was a wild aristocratic poet, I tell you, Edward de Vere, even more so. But he was... He was putting out his life through his works. His favourite poet was Ovid, and Ovid confessed his life through his works, and that's precisely what Edward de Vere was doing. Hamlet, everyone has always said, is highly autobiographical. I mean, just any part of Hamlet you can take and say, well, that actually happened in Edward de Vere's life. I mean, what happens... What happens in King Lear? I mean, we have uh, a, a king who gives away his ancient patrimony to his three daughters. What did Edward de Vere do? He gave away his patrimony to his three daughters. And the great problems that caused with him wanting to revisit them. A, a play that a lot of people haven't really looked at very much is Timon of Athens. And that's a play about a man who goes uh, completely bankrupt and has to sell his estate and all the and he's so generous to he's such a great patron of everyone and those bloody people once he's run out of money they turn on him really nastily that's exactly precisely what happened to Edward Devere and on and on and on I mean I was like the example of a winter's tale winter's tale in French would be can you do French yeah, yeah, yeah. Le uh, Conte uh, Le Conte d'Hiver, the tale of Vier, in other words. Oh! And what's it about? It's about a man who, uh, King Leontes, who hotly denies the paternity of uh, his wife's child and says, it's not mine, it's not mine. And someone called Paulina comes, if you remember, in the play and says, I've, I've got this really clever plan. I'll tell you what, we'll bring the baby to show Leontes and he'll look at it, oh, that's sweet, and he'll poke it around a little bit and only after we'll tell him that's actually his baby and that, then he'll like it. OK, what happened to Edward de Vere, do you suppose? I don't need to repeat it, because yeah. all of that, all of that, he denied the paternity of his child. He fell out very badly with his wife. What, what do you think Othello's about, for heaven's sake? Where was Edward de Vere when he discovered that his wife had been unfaithful? He felt she'd been unfaithful and got pregnant and had a baby that wasn't his. He was in Venice at the time. Why are all those plays set in Venice? You know, the whole thing is completely autobiographical. And that gives another reason that after Vere's death in 1604, that his nephews and nieces and children, who were still quite high up in court circles, did not wish for the connection of Shakespeare and Edward de Vere to spill out. Ah, and did he have a friend who was chased by a bear? By any chance? Uh, I don't know about that, but he, he may have, he, he, well, he may have <laughs> seen something like that. But what he, he, what he did have, of course, is a cousin, Horatio, uh, who he trusts very much. And if you remember in mm. Hamlet, he, at the very end of Hamlet, he, he gives, he, he entrusts Horatio to, to, to bear his story as Hamlet is dying, um, to, to take the family story forward. Um, and that's why he's called Horatio, I'm pretty sure. So, OK, so we've got the, the financial records, the documents showing that, that, that Queen Elizabeth, using her black budget, um, was fine. Uh, by the way, what would you say it was worth a lot, a thousand pounds? Well, I, all I can say is there were practically no one else who got so much money out of, out of, out of that. I, 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 I would guess it's, over, it's a million and a half about a year. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the excuse is, oh, oh well, I, I, I can't have one of my courtiers going bust. But I mean, other courtiers came craving. And the other interesting thing about Veer is, is Veer kept saying, well, look, if, you know, I, I, I could go and run a, a, a tin mine in Cornwall. I could go and do this because the Queen had this great patronage to give out these concessions. But she wouldn't give it to him ever, nothing. Wouldn't give him a position in government, which he, you know, or on the Privy Council. Because she, I, believe she wanted him sitting there writing okay. those plays which highly amused her which she utterly loved and she saw the value of them uh to the to the to the country and to the commonwealth oh she's a bit like queenie in blackadder she likes she she likes being entertained she loves being entertained i've just written a nine-part dramatic script of Vera's life and i've had great fun writing the queen's part she's so loves the plays and finds them so funny and is jolly pleased to see how they irritate the courtiers around her so of oh. course very, very obvious case is, is Polonius in Hamlet, 
who's, if you remember, rather long-winded, yeah. boring sort of fellow, um, who in every respect is Lord Burley, her chief statesman, who was Edward de Vere's father-in-law, so he could get away with teasing her. If William Sh Stratford of Shakespeare had written any of that, he would have had his head chopped yeah, in yeah. one and a half seconds flat. Okay, so we've got the financial records, we've got the um, the numerology and the, and the codes and stuff, which you've dealt with in a... a uh, you know, in your videos, then we've got the um, the biographical evidence. I think we've we've sort of pretty much covered the basics. So I, I want to move on to asking you some other questions. If, if, uh, yes, you can. Can I? The one last point which I'd like to bring point. on from Polonius, because I have people occasionally come up to me saying, "What does it matter who wrote Shakespeare so long as he got the plays?" And I'll tell you, every single one of them to a man who asks me that question. If you look at them carefully, as they're asking it, they're they're. they're fists are all tense and their shoulders are tense yeah. so they mind very much indeed who wrote Shakespeare so pretending don't, what doesn't matter but back to this idea of lampooning contemporary courtiers you suddenly realise take that example of Polonius the absolute meta genius that is going on in those plays because you know take take the example of the play within the play remember the mousetrap and what goes on within Hamlet and they, yeah. put, they put on this play in order to capture the conscience of the king who's Claudius who's Leicester so Claudius is based on Leicester, who stole a lot of Edward de Vere's money and tried to make Edward de Vere treat him as his father after his father died. Now, you remember in Hamlet, the father dies and nasty Claudius says, grow up, stop being so babyish and weeping about your father. You can count me as your father. Well, this is exactly what Leicester did to Edward de Vere. OK, right. So and and according to Hamlet, um, this Claudius murdered the father. Yeah, yeah. Murder, murdered King Hamlet, yeah, yeah. Old, old King Hamlet. Um, Leicester gained enormously and was one of the trustees on, on the will of Edward de Vere's father. So it all ties in again. I'm telling you, it's, it's very, very, very um, uh, uh, autobiographical. Now, just back to this meta thing, which is so fascinating. Just imagine you're watching Hamlet and you are the Earl of Leicester. OK, yeah. you're watching the play within the play where they're pricking the conscience of Claudius and you're watching as Lester, who is realizes you're being lampooned as Claudius. So you've got a third level going on yeah. of sophistication. And if you just say, I don't care who wrote the plays, you're going to lose all of that. And there's plenty of it. You, well, do you, do you think that um, Lester did murder? Uh, I, 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 I think it's a distinct possibility. He, he pushed, how, how he pushed you... one of his wives down the stairs. We, well, got someone else to do it and broke her neck. Amy, Amy Robesart, she was called. Uh, he's known to have used poison on people. He's supposed to have killed, uh, Walter Deverux in Ireland. Uh, and there's a whole book called Leicester's Commonwealth accusing him of such things as that. And as I say, he was a, he was a friend of, of Edward de Vere's father. He was there. In the days, literally in the days just before Edward de Vere's father died, uh, unexpectedly, suddenly, out of nothing, and enormously benefited. And the Queen let him take over because Edward de Vere was only 12 years old when his father died. Right. So he didn't reach his majority until 21. And Leicester had complete control of all de Vere's estates in that time. So now you begin to understand why Shakespeare, if he's Edward de Vere, really wanted to write that play. Hamlet. Yeah. And it's not his story. It's ancient. But the bits, all those details I'm talking about are, are Shakespeare's only. They don't come from the original old Danish tale or whatever. And you've, you've certainly answered the question. Which I know you get asked a lot, which is, well, if, if Edward de Vere was so good, why would he want to keep his identity secret? Why? But, but, I mean, he was a pious man and a holy man and he was self-effacing and he had three reasons why not to. And look, just read your Shakespeare sonnets. You know, my, my name be buried where my body is, no long to shame nor me or you. He says in those sonnets that I'm involved in such a lot of scandal that my name is gone. My works are what are going to live on. Yeah. He says it himself. So how people are dim enough to get an early quarter of the Shakespeare sonnets, which says Shakespeare's sonnets with a hyphen, a very telling hyphen between Shake and Spears, but Shakespeare's sonnets on every page and say he's hiding his name. Hang on, his name's there. It doesn't make any sense. Now, I'm going to... Move on to something um, which has been cropping up a lot recently in my in my reading about Gnosticism, and that all the court in those days were probably Gnostics to some degree or other, were they not? Uh, I've got a feeling. Uh, I've got a, uh, okay. Let's be careful about the use of words. Uh, Gnostic is something fairly specific, which an enormous amount of people misunderstand. Okay. Uh, Christian Gnostics uh, were, to my, my mind, good, honest, honourable people 
who got a few things wrong. Right. And they got things wrong, I think, starting from the, the ancient problem and premise of all the evil that's in the world. So how, yes. how could God, who we love, uh, and Christ, whom we love, be part of one tripartite body that allows all this evil and all this horror? Um, and so they tried to separate that out, and they, they, they went with the view that Sophia, or wisdom, sometimes identified with the Holy Spirit, but not always, uh, had been slightly chucked down, not like Satan right down to earth, but just been cast down a little bit uh, uh, by God. And so she is in the eighth, eighth realm. Okay, so we have earth, then we have the seven planets, each with their realm, and then we have the stars into which Sophia, wisdom, was sitting according to this Gnostic thought. And, and she had a baby uh, called the Demiurge, and the Demiurge went down, and he was the one who fundamentally created this evil world that we're in. Well, mm. the evil world actually is not totally denied by the Bible. You know, we're told in the Bible that the Prince of Darkness <laughs> basically runs it. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the sort of beginning of Gnosticism. And, of course, what immediately happens is when you get the powerful churches, the Church of Rome in particular, they want to sit down and have everything their way and be the rulers of everything and clamp down very heavily on the Gnostics it's because they have a slightly different story to tell. So then what naturally happens is the Gnostics start talking to one another or writing in slightly secretive ways and using these things like codes and slightly hidden ways of writing. And you can easily argue that out of that comes some of the sort of Freemasonic stuff we see today. But all I'm trying to urge you and other listeners, don't, don't, just don't be rigid and just say Gnostics are evil. I think they had good intentions and good people and they were forced into secrecy. That's really interesting. That's, that's an interesting take because I, I watched that, um, listened to that podcast by somebody who's done a, a series on Francis Bacon, and he argues that 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 Bacon leads to scientism and all the things that the Rosicrucianism, Rosicrucianism, and, mm. but 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 ultimately it leads to the the, the Committee of Three Hundred, the WEF, the the yes. ridiculous yes. environmental policies, and yes, or, but why? Why does it lead there? It leads there because because the Bacon, who is an honest, well, mm. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll, I'll withdraw yeah, that. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll withdraw that word. But I, I think he was certainly a very earnest and true scientist and scholar and philosophy yeah. philosopher in that particular respect. He he may have done something corrupt when he was an MP, which he was charged with. Um, but he t he took the view, and we, we touched on this near the beginning. That I uh, know oh, we didn't. We talked about it before we got on air. He took the view that God created, and this was a common view, that God created the world using letters and numbers, mm. and that therefore our way to get close to God mm. is to pursue knowledge. And that could be knowledge of anything, knowledge of this microphone, knowledge of our fingernails. Anything in this world, we need to pursue the knowledge of it, and by doing that and understanding it through letters and numbers, i.e. through the written word and through its correlation to numbers, we will get ultimately closer to God. So, yeah. so, so his drive was pious. Yeah, it, this led after the uh, closing of the theatres and after the Commonwealth era into the founding of the Royal Society, uh, which was uh, chock a block with uh, Freemasons. Yeah. Uh, we, if we go forward uh, sort of hundred years from there, uh, we find the the Freema Freemasonic movement is infiltrated by an extremely bad group called the Illuminati in about uh, in about uh, seventeen seventy six, and on both occasions, I would say that the Freemasons were infiltrating in order to get power. They're, they're now getting interested in personal power more than, um, and I'm talking about the top echelons of this. Yeah. You know, I think it's so mean if you meet a Freemason. I would never be a Freemason. As I said, I'm not interested in secrets. But if you meet a Freemason and say, oh, oh you're a baddie, stand back. I think the vast majority of Freemasons know absolutely nothing about what's going on at the top end. Mm. The top end is deeply imbued with satanic evil and power mania, as is the top end of the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church, and these things you're talking about. And of course, once the Illuminati got in, and then they used the networks of Freemasons in order to get onto presidents in the United States and everything, uh, now we suddenly find ourselves in the, in the place we're in now, which is, which is a very, very corrupted world that can be basically run from a very few people's uh, desks. Okay, so I would, I would accept your line about the Illuminati infiltrating and suborning maybe Freemasonry, but the the, the strains of evil that that, that emerged uh, with 
or Adam Adam Weishaupt was it? Adam Weishaupt, yeah. Adam Weishaupt. The, this existed long before Adam, Adam long before the the eighteenth century. Yes, and we're, we're we're talking we're, we're going back to the Babylonian mystery re- religions. So there must have been factions. Who were the representatives of evil? Within the Elizabethan court and within the, you're not saying that the, the founders of the Royal Society were all goodies, are you? Uh, the, uh, no, no, absolutely, no. I'm not saying no. that for one second. But I think there were those among them uh, who were goodies. I mean, let's we can start throwing a few names. Yeah, around. Let's, and, I'd like to I know mean, who are the goodies. Who are Isaac the Newton, well, he was baddie, wasn't he? Uh, I don't know. Pa- apparently, I don't know. I don't know. A mathematical was was balls, was, yeah. was, was, was bollocks. In, incomprehensible. Yeah, incomprehensible. <laughs> and and it was it was like you don't. It's a bit like 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 uh, climate change now. You don't understand because you're not a climate scientist. Yeah. And so many people have been uh, have been persuaded into thinking this way that yeah, well, I'm I'm not qualified to, 100%, to comment. Hundred percent. And and governments producing it's aligned to governments producing endless acts that are 580 pages long that yeah. nobody's going to read through and nobody's are too complicated and too boring and you see it actually with the german philosophers and hegel and people like that schopenhauer absolutely furious they're all writing in incomprehensible ways and and the point about them according to schopenhauer was that they were doing it deliberately to sound clever but um god knows what they're doing they're trying to wield power in some crazy way there's there's um uh i don't know whether you've you've um come across um uh Miri, Miriam Finch, uh, Miri AF. Yes. I did, I did a podcast with yes. her. And she's got this phrase, if you know the name, they're in the game. And I've increasingly become of the view that all the figures, the great figures in history, they get there for a reason. And it's not because they're, they're serving our interests. They're, they're, you, maybe they've made the pact. Well, certainly, you can apply this to celebrity culture now. Hollywood, they've they've made a pact, an, a, an overt, a literal pact with with the devil in in many cases. Uh, I can't imagine this rule is just a twentieth century uh, plus phenomenon. I'm sure it goes back much further than that. It, so- it's it's hard to say, isn't it? Because because the way it works is through control, and the way control is through political power, where we can literally string someone up, and money. Um, and we're in a very, very extraordinary position in the world today where you can see how uh, money and political power is all sort of coming together in a vortex, uh, which gives fewer and fewer people extraordinary amounts of control. I mean, you only have to take the existence of Amazon, for instance. I mean, if that carries on, you're, you're, you've got one shop in the world. And, and we, yeah. we, we've seen all the pressures that are put on, on the little shops in the high streets everywhere. They're all closing down. It's all going totally, totally wrong for them. Not by accident. This is, this is yes. happening on purpose because what it means is if you're in government to control the world supply of almost anything if you've only got one shop it's very 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 easy you bring in jeff bezos and say right i'm gonna slam you into prison and destroy you if you don't do this that it's, that, the, and it's this. the one ring total control and total control over what we're buying and that's just one example but that's a major example but, but so you know, you say this has gone on and on forever. I, 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 you're totally right that evil has gone on forever and disgusting habits regarding the massacre of children and all sorts of things have gone on forever. But I'm, you can probably tell, and we, we all have our Achilles heel, mm. and, and my Achilles heel is, is getting Shakespeare, who I honour and I think was just about as great as any human being can be, and who is, when you know who he is, very closely connected to God and very pious, I don't want to smear him with the sort of tar brush that we knew do now need to smear what's going on in Hollywood and that sort of atrocious behaviour that's happening there. It just it just seems a world away. And as I said about Bacon, it's the same with Shakespeare. They, there was a genuine thirst for knowledge on the understanding that it would get them closer to God. And and if you look at Shakespeare, what he's doing, what's he's doing? He's not hogging knowledge for himself. He's sharing it with the world. And this is a very, very noble thing. He's, he's, he's burning himself out, disappearing, losing all of his name, as he says, while, while he gives everything to the world, like the pelican who, who takes off its, bites into its own breast to, to, to give to the little chicklings. I'm, I'm really glad that you've, uh, you, you've corrected some of my, Hardcore, or, or give an alternative view to my my hardcore perspective, because I think sometimes one can be a bit, um, a bit extreme in one's judgments. And I, for example, people have said, possibly on my my channel or something. Well, of course, anyone descended from Evelyn War is going to be 
in on the game you know part of the part isn't it so so of course he'd be be throwing out these 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 shapes or, or yes but but Evelyn Moore wasn't in the game was he 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 was an outsider and and well I was wondering about this I was so so I I mean I wasn't wondering about his I was thinking about I was reading um on holiday I was reading the pursuit of love mm-hmm. and I was thinking about the Mitford sisters and obviously Nancy who wrote the pursuit of love so she was she was friends with you know big mates with evelyn and they they they, they corresponded and then you've got unity was it who was the friend of of hitler uh or was that decker i uh, know decker was the communist uh yes unity yes yes yeah, right. decker was the communist mm-hmm. and then there was debo who, who, who married Duke Duke devonshire. Duke devonshire well anyone who marries into the into that that level of aristocracy is going to be connected with the black nobility with- all, all right, but look, it's a bit of a leap from Debo Devonshire to Evelyn Ward. They they knew each other certainly. No, no, um, no, no, no. I, hang on, I, 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 you, you're being defensive because it's it's your granddad. I wasn't I wasn't <laughs> suggesting that he knew, but what I'm suggesting is that is that he was adjacent to people who must uh, the Mitford sisters must have been aware on some level, because the whole narrative aware of what? Well, th- st- taking a step back, every. One of the many things I've learned, you know, that, that evolutionary theory is just is just bollocks. Um, we didn't go to the moon. Dinosaurs didn't aren't, aren't real. Everything we know about World War Two, pretty much, apart from the, the the names of the battles and the dates, was a lie. Uh, the origins of the Second World War, absolute rubbish. Unity Mitford hanging out with Hitler must have been privy to a level of information that that most. Most ordinary folk wouldn't be aware. She was, and she yeah. was a, a cousin of Churchill's too, I think. Yeah. So, 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 I can see why people, people, uh, sort of the awake are suspicious of any of the names because they they are privy to a level of information that most ordinary people never get. So they they must know to a degree mm. what's really going on, how the world works. Uh, well, to, to a degree, I, I agree with you, but on another degree, um, you have to look at the individual cases. And, and you suggested just now, very politely, I didn't take any umbrage, oh. that I was defending you out of family pietas because yeah. he was my grandfather. Yeah. I, I'm also a great expert on him. I'm the editor of 43 volume scholarly edition of his works, and I understand him, him very well. And, yeah. and, and he, he, he was a rebel. He, he never voted. Um, he said, I, I refused to vote on the rather strange trumped up grounds that he, he thought it wasn't his duty to advise Her Majesty on how to form her government. Uh, my, my father was uh, Auburn War, a satirical journalist who spent his life just throwing brickbats at politicians yeah. and, and would never, never in a million years would he have been honoured or given a CBE or anything like that. Um, uh, and yes, Evelyn War was, was well connected. The interesting thing about Evelyn War is he craved always from childhood to adulthood to, to belong, to be part of something. Yeah. He, he, he wanted to be part of his family. He was rejected by his family or at least by his father because his older brother was much more wonderful to his father. Uh, he wanted to be part of sort of sports teams at school, but he wasn't very good enough. He wanted to join the army when he was too old in the, in the, in the Second World War, desperately. But and, and every single time, and, and the Catholic Church is another example, yeah, yeah. every single time he joined something, because he wanted and needed that sense of joining, every single time he became disappointed, disillusioned, and, uh, and, and depressed about it. All yeah. of those things I've mentioned, he was depressed about. So he was a misfit. And misfits, I'm sorry, don't um, don't uh, get to be part of this sort of cabal with a deep knowledge of what's going on. Yeah, uh, particularly ones who are dangerous. And he was dangerous in the sense you simply couldn't predict what was going to come out of his mouth. And and he could meet the grandest person in the world and say, "Why am I sitting next to this awful bore?" Shouting it across the table to his yeah. hostess. So he was he was fearless and not never part of the sort of swim of people all sucking up and telling lies. The other thing I'll say about him, and I'll give you one quotation from him, and I try and imitate the voice he said it in. He said it on radio, "I don't understand lies." So that's what we started out with. Well, oddly enough, um, you did for me what I was I was struggling to do myself. Um, I think you thought I was suggesting that he was he was one of them. Actually, what I was trying to say, but you said it much better than I could have done, is that it's a mistake to assume that everyone is everyone with a name is in on it. I I know, I'm not going to name them, but I know some people who are well connected in the world, you know, on the, on a kind of 
Mitford level or fashionista level, let's say, or or, a, um, or connected with Hollywood, I'm thinking, who you would think because of the, of, of where they are in 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 the in in the in the pyramid would be aware of what's going on and kind of with it because all their mates are doing it. But I know that there is resistance at every every level. Not everyone is in on the game. And you're talking about the Hollywood game, which is no, I'm if, talking if about we've got it right, every is game. particularly disagreeable. Yeah. And that not only are the, the actors themselves uh, trapped if they don't perform certain things. Mm. And we hear all these appalling rumors about deaths of certain people's mothers and sons and things. Which yes. Are, uh, but, but so, so the, again, it's, it, it's that their, their families are in jeopardy. You know, they are, they have to play the game. Yeah. And it's just hell. It's literally hell. And you can say, well, bad luck, you guys, because you haven't read the story of Faust and you've went and sold your souls. But a lot of these people are very young, very talented. Everybody knows how difficult it is to become a famous actor or whatever it is. And if suddenly someone stands in front of you and says, well, I can, I can make you really famous instantly, they get into it. And I, there may be people who are listening to this who don't know what the hell we're talking about. But I think once you dig a bit, you can find it. And it is horrific. I was I was wondering actually I I just sometimes wonder what would have happened had I been approached at that age when you want to get on yeah. above all else if they're telling you he's got this it's just packed it's just a bit of blood is all we need and um you know, but but you're going to get some really really cool shit and you're trusting and, so and you don't do you, drugs and, uh, you're going to get all that and then you're and you're very trusting you don't you don't really realize how evil people can be until no. until it comes in front of your face. And then you're already in a trap. And yeah. what I understand is some of these things that they're forced to go through, they're sort of incremental. It's one thing worse, another worse thing. You know, show, show us you're really part of, a, part of this team. Do this now. Do this. And it becomes more and more horrible. And, the, and, of course, the more sinful they behave, well, criminal they behave, the more they clan together to keep the secret. To, it's, just, it's just hell. Although I wonder, Alexander, because of the thing that, you talk, that we discovered – before, before we, I did a tiny bit of research, which is very against my principles. Yes. But I watched some of your the, the, the your John D episode, and you were talking about numerology and how obsessed the Elizabethans were words with the with the symbolism of, the, of, the, of their of their names, John D and, and and so I used the alphabet um, coding that you. Which doesn't include the complete alphabet. It has to use only the Roman alphabet, isn't that right? Latin Roman alphabet, Latin, yeah. yeah. Um, to work out the numerology or the, 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 the number of your name. The number, is, how, is how they would the number of my name. Describe it, yeah. And James Dellingpole is 139. And I said to you. Interesting. I said, well, what does, does it mean anything, Alexander? And what did you say? Well, I've actually, since we've been talking, dividing my brain into and thinking about 139 a little bit harder. And actually, it could be even more interesting than that, uh, because 1391 can, uh, symbolically, it's the same symbol as I. Yeah? Hang on, 1391. One. Oh, sorry, 1, the number oh, 1. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and 3 is a very obvious number concerning the Trinity. Yeah. And 9 uh, in, in Latin is I X which is Iota Chi in Greek, Jesus Christus, it's the, it's, the, it's the initials of Jesus Christ. And what's interesting about that to me is I happen to know that you are quite Christian, very, yeah. very Christian, yeah. um, and that what John Dee said right back in the 16th century is everyone should try to meditate upon the number of their name and ally it to the Holy Trinity. Um, and so what seems to come out from your number is is Christ as a Christian and and the three of the Trinity. Um, so I, w I would say I, you're, you're connecting yourself to it. I, James Denning, yeah. square brackets, uh, Christ and the Trinity. So I, I would say you've, you've probably completed the task that John Dee set back in 1570. And just to change that, keep going, I'm yeah. just to change the light thing. With that thing. Uh, um, and, and so, and and now, now, if John D were to be among us now, and yeah. we could say, what, what, what do we make about? What, what do we make of that? Yeah. Uh, he would say that is a message from God. God created the world in numbers. Numbers are significant. James Dellingpole has got that number for a significant divine reason, and God is messaging to you that reason. Yeah, using using my parents as as, as his. Um 
I mean, his agents or whatever, they, because they, they, when they gave me the name James, they didn't know they were choosing. But do we know what, what's happening? Do, no, we don't. don't. Take creative artists. I mean, to, to what extent are they, are they being channeled? Uh, you know, you ask any creative artist, how did you do this? How did you do this amazing painting? How did you write this incredible book? Yeah. I mean, unless they're bluffers and bores and liars, they'll all say, I have the faintest notion. I sat down at my desk, I did it, and it came. Now, the message we're getting endlessly through through the Shakespeare, some of the stuff I've decoded, yeah. is these sonnets are by God and De Vere. And that doesn't mean that God sat there and picked up a pen and literally wrote it, but that Vere wrote those poems by the grace of God that was within him. And you'll find this in, in Corinthians, uh, where St. Paul talks about the labor, uh, the labor that he did. It, he did the labor, but it was by the grace of God that he did it. And again, this comes back. Do you know the phrase, I am that I am? Yeah. And you'll find that not many people use that about themselves. Certainly old people who understand it because it's considered blasphemous because uh, it's suggested that I am is the name of God and I am that I am. Remember in Exodus, Moses says uh, to God, he's, he has a vision of God. He says, he says who shall I t- I've got to go and speak to the others. Who, sh- who shall I say I spoke to? And God replies, I am that I am. And St. Paul brings this up as well. And and those who had the audacity to say, I am that I am, look at Shakespeare's sonnet 121, are suggesting they're talking about the divine within themselves and their connection to God and how God, through God and through the grace within him, they, they create these amazing works. Um, I'm just, I don't want you to miss the church. What time is it? Ooh, um, yeah, I think I just want to ask you one more thing. Um, because we could talk for hours, but we uh, can, and we can talk in the church unless it's very diverting. No, which um, no but, but I want to get, I don't want to waste stuff on the, um, I read, I, I don't think it was on your recommendation, but I, 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 I left it on the beach. Unfortunately, I, I didn't finish it. The secret history of the world. Yes. Which is very, very interesting. It, it, it's clearly written from the perspective of someone who holds the kind of, by a man called something black. That's, he's the head of a publishing company. That's a weird name. To I have read black. that book and I found it very interesting. You, well, interesting. So, but but it's obviously written from an anti-Christian perspective, in, in as much as the implication is that Christianity is just one religion among many, and that it, I think that, you're right about that. Yes. Um, uh, and I'm curious. I mean, I I, I really am curious. There's, there's there's an element in 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 uh, among Christians that I I cannot relate to which are the what I call them the trust the plan Christians who are very anti-intellectual don't want to think too much about about the, the religion or ask awkward questions like why does why does um uh here a poor not the virgin's womb because that line to me is also is also a, a, I, I say the te deum every day and every time I, I come I come upon that line I think well why why is why it, would he why, abhor the why would he, exactly I mean, there, there is a technical reason apparently but uh, but but, oh, but sure. anyway I think these 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 for for some of us you know maybe maybe curiosity curiosity did kill the cat but nevertheless I think that there ought to be room for intellectualism and curiosity w- w- within within Christianity um, and. I can't remember what I was going to... What was well, you started by talking about the secrets of the world. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I read it some time ago, and and one of my lasting memories, which I did think was extremely interesting, mm. is he says in that book that all these sort of Hercules and mythology people yeah. and unicorns, whatever, they were actually true. Yes. And we could actually see them in those days. Yes. Uh, but what's happened is as, as man has evolved, they've, they've closed down, closed away from the spiritual world that actually is all, always around us. We yes. can't see it. And one of the rather fascinating examples he gave, I thought, was about a newborn baby which has this fontanelle, yeah. uh, this sort of hole, if you like, in the skull that eventually closes up. And he shows in that book, I think, some very, very ancient statues of, of figures with sort of slightly strange eyes poking out the tops of their heads or whatever. And he connects this to the pineal gland which yes. lots of people say is is the gland in the body that actually does uh, send and receive messages to the spiritual world yeah. and and his argument I, as i understood it or at least his explanation is as human beings have evolved their bone structures got thicker and thicker and now this is all closed off and god knows what else wi-fi and so so we really are mucking about with the remnants of our pineal gland and the reason for this is we are slowly evolving ourselves into gods that we don't really need to see these gods. Now, look, these are just all arguments, but I mean, I just, I, I did find it rather fascinating. I'm not going to say I, I completely 
that went was, with it. was all interesting. I tell, you, I tell you my problem with it. And I, I was waiting for the moment. I was saying, okay, I'm, I'm open, open to all, everything you say, but there's something you're not mentioning. You're not mentioning that the people who kind of espouse your kind of thinking, this sort of hermetic knowledge, this, this sort of the, the occult, secretive language, they're in the business of torturing and murdering children for adrenochrome, which 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 the, the God is constantly complaining about to, about the children of Israel that are pushing their children in the fire. This goes back a long time, and these people hate Christians more than anything, and they're trying to persecute them. Mm. Why are you not mentioning this stuff? I mean, it's all very well talking about this airy fairy well, intellectual. And he says he's not a Freemason in that book as yeah. well, which I don't believe because I've been lied to by Freemasons who say that. Hey, look, can I just quickly recommend a book I'm reading at the moment? It's yeah. absolutely extraordinary. And now I've forgotten the title, but it's by Tom Bree. It's just out. Tom, someone called Tom Bree. And it's about uh, cathedral. He, he, he particularly looks at Wales Cathedral. And it's about cathedral architecture. And he explains Gnosticism very, very well. And about how these symbols are put in there um a, a remarkable symbols and if, if you understand the architecture you understand you get very close to god and how it's all veered i, I think you would be really like i'll tell you what i'll send it to you okay it's tom yeah. Bree. but if we've got to uh, go and see the church for it closes um and i want to re- uh, again because i'm so happy thank you ian D- dickinson for for um advertising your wonderful product on my show i i wish people well please do more of this everyone um and please, please, please go to Ian's website, which is Tinderella, as in Cinderella, but with a T for Tommy instead, Tinderella.info forward slash. And, it, and it, uh, what he says is whether you're looking for satirical synth pop, we all like synth pop, don't we? Or sardonic tales of modern romance, Tinderella's songs have it all. They will make you laugh, cry, and hit like and subscribe simultaneously. Visit Tinderella.info to listen to the sound of tomorrow today. Thank you, Ian, for your advert. Please, everyone, go to Tinderella.info. Um, Alexander, where can people find your stuff? Uh, you go to YouTube. And you press Alexander War, and the channel is called Alexander War. I've divided, I think there are 60 videos on there now. I've divided them into three essential bits. And there, there are two things I would like your listeners to pay attention. There are two packages of, of ones. And one is called Who Knew? And that sounds so boring. Nobody's going to click on it. It's not a clickbait. Who Knew? And the titles of the, my videos are so boring in that box because they're people you never have heard of. John Warren knew. Someone else knew. You might have heard of Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson knew. Definitely. Click on those, and each of those shows a contemporary of William Shakespeare who knew that it was a pseudonym and knew who it was and I go through the reasons for it uh, the other box that I'd like you to look at is called where was Shakespeare really buried and I've done a lot of work on that and we we, we, we discussed a bit of it now so excellent yeah. well thank you for coming all this way to do this but I've been dying to this for ages a and delight. if you enjoyed it everyone um yeah please go to Alexander's site please support my sponsors Please do um, subscribe. I, I, I never ask people to press the subscribe button. I think you should do that. It's important. Everyone else, all the other podcasters say that. So I guess you must do it. Please support me on Locals, Patreon, Subscribestar, Substack, or buy me a coffee. Thank you very much for your support. I really appreciate it. Um, and that's it. Bye. Bye.